Let's talk about Gaspar Casado's suite for solo cello today. So Casado was a great cellist and you can hear him on YouTube. There's a bunch of recordings. I couldn't find a recording of the uh, suite. He studied composition actually uh, with Maurice Ravel. So he's, uh, you know, was very ambitious as a composer. Uh, and uh, he also studied with Manuel de Falla. Um, this suite was written only 10 years after Ravel wrote his uh, Daphne and Chloe. And you can hear in bar 11, the theme from this beautiful suite. is in D minor. When you get ready to perform this, it's, it seems very free. It is a preludio fantasia. But I think as the basis, we have to be clear on where uh, every beat falls. So you should be able, ideally, to count aloud while you practice. So... <laughs> If you can't speak while playing, which is difficult, try to conduct yourself while imagining this or actually singing out loud. So, yeah. Da, 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 ya, da, da, da. Um, something like, like that. Um, and sometimes when I conduct in three or uh, see in my mind uh, a couple dancing a waltz, I feel the three, bars 15 and 16s. Um, for Mehemiola. Yeah, it's also at the end of the first section here. Uh, it's a Baroque, reminds me of a Baroque technique, like Bach would finish uh, a lot of his uh, movements with Hemiolas, a lot of the first half of the movements with Hemiolas. So here. <laughs> So now let's look at the overall structure. We have the first section right at the beginning um, called the A section. And then the B section uh, is uh, starts at bar 11, which is that beautiful Chloe, uh, Daphne and Chloe theme. And then the C section starts in bar 17 here. <laughs> So my edition doesn't have bar numbers, so you might have to add your own bar numbers. But um, uh, this A section repeats, the andante comes back in bar 40. Uh, so the beginning we have... And then bar 40. a different character. The B section, this beautiful quote from uh, Daphne St. Chloe, uh, comes in bar 46. Uh, this section is, is very long. It goes from bar 46 to bar 64. Um, and it feels like an improvisation. Um, I like to uh, play this for Sandy on a dambo. <laughs> that um, be sure you have the apple uh, before bar 50. Here in bar 50, um, we have 11 groups of 11 notes. So in my mind, I separate those groups of 11 notes to six notes plus five notes. So <laughs> So that the F sharp is a start of the subgroup of five. Um, here, tranquilo. Um, here, I practice it just with a lot of patience and care. <laughs> 
tricky. It's hard to speak with those uh, harmonics when we're nervous. So be sure at home you play them super crisp. Otherwise, um, in concert, they're going to be like... <laughs> Don't be shy about vibrating those um, harmonics. Um, the way I practice uh, artificial harmonics is in just separately. So I separate the D sharp and the G sharp. I'm sure um, I get both of them very clean and then only then I play it uh, with the both together. Uh, and uh, the C section comes again in bar 64. So, so I always like to compare um, section to section, uh, parallel places, and see what is the difference. So here in bar 17, we have piano espressivo, poco più mosso, and we are in A major. And bar 64, we have piano espressivo and poco più mosso again, same thing, but we are uh, in D major. So. Um, we have a G minor section, which is the B section again that Daphne St. Chloe quote in bar 73. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know the story, um, it is a love story. This is a very romantic uh, uh, quote. <laughs> when you practice this piece to feel the clear beat and where the heavy beats fall, uh, I suggest uh, eliminating the embellishments so that, for example, in bar 17, <laughs> that would be the naked um, version. Um, and only then, only after you are feeling very secure with how the phrase should go, uh, you can add the embellishments. In order to keep the beat going more or less in tempo, you can stretch bar 18, but still a little time from the B flat. So. <laughs> are as if they're written in parentheses. Similarly in bars 38 and 39. And just practice it without the embellishments first. So bars 46 to 50, we have a lot of notes um, and we can also simplify there. So very very simple uh, version and then little by little you can add in. important to feel that uh, uh, the a and g in bar 48 as the downbeat uh, here in bar 49 be sure you're lifting your fingers so that um, it's not muddy in order to understand how to play a ritardando that's written under complex rhythms, I first play without the ritardando. So if we're looking at bar 51. It's better, in my opinion.
opinion, to divide uh, this bar into groups of eight. So. Um... <laughs> That would be if we were not to slow down at all. Uh, and then from there you can uh, work your way to the as much rotundo as you feel is right. So. But it is important to understand how the bar is constructed. In order to feel the quintuplet in bar 22, I like to put words to it. Rimsky-Korsakov is obviously two plus three, so that doesn't always fit a quintuplet, um, but this one does work. Sometimes when we have a lot of chords, it's great to separate the melody from the chord so that we can hear uh, it clearly and know how to build the phrase. Uh, if we look at bar 27, we have... Uh, <laughs> to play the melody separately or and only then add the rest of the chord. In bar 78 I feel that the E flat is the pivot moment and um, you can compare it to the first time that the B section came but here that repeats uh, the last four bars we have so if you look at the dashes above the notes and uh, try to uh, follow the indication by the composer it will add uh, so as if there are two uh, separate voices the, the one with the dashes and the one with the slurs don't forget to vibrate see you next time